Let me introduce to you Heba Kamis, uh, co-founder and CEO of Contactile, who works in robotics and who has a PhD from this very institution. She will lead the panel, um, introduce the panel members, and take it from here. To my left, I have um, a distinguished professor, Fang Cheng, who's also executive director of UTS Data Science and UTS Data Science Institute at, obviously, UTS. Uh, we have Flora Salim, who's a professor of data science at RMIT University in Melbourne and incoming professor and Cisco Chair of Digital Transport Centre for Critical Data Infrastructure at UNSW Sydney. We have uh, Dr John Whittle, who's the director of CSIRO's Data61, which is the digital research arm of uh, CSIRO. And at the end, we have Roger Allen, who's the co-founder, director and chairman at Allen and Buckridge. So I just wanted to uh, kick things off first with each of the panelists giving you know a, a little five minute or, or less spiel on where they feel that computer science is uh, taking us in the future um, with their little spin you know based on their different backgrounds. So we'll just go along the line. So Fang, please take it away. Well, lucky first. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's my great pleasure to be here and to celebrate this moment with all of you. I would like to start uh, talking a little bit of my self-reflection of uh, where I come from and, and you know, uh, how I see the world changing without computer science. So, you know, I started my PhD actually in speech recognition. So, a while ago, not 70 years ago, of course. And at that time, I'm really, I was really struggling with, uh, you know, memories, with the database, and uh, the availability is a small database with a North American accent. So in order to hit the high accuracy, I have to fake my, you know, North American accent. I forgot now because we got an Australian database, got a, all kinds of a different database. I can just speak whatever accent I have. The second story I want to reflect to is about, about 10 years ago, first time I attended a water conference, international water conference on managing assets. So I've been reporting to a, a paper we work with the Sydney Water on uh, detecting water pipe failure. The challenge is, you know, with the uh, you know, water pipes buried underneath the uh, uh, civil infrastructure for 100 years or 200 years. Average, uh, by the way, average pipe size age in Sydney is about 80 years old. And um, you've got, uh, you know, uh, different interactions with the weather, with soil, with the traffic, with uh, everything you can imagine. And with the very limited uh, data as a ground truth, is less than 0.5% of the sparse data. And the challenge is, uh, is huge. So first time I reported in that international conference with the uh, word machine learning. Attracted so many people, they don't know what machine learning is. And uh, we end up as a dinner party and people just asking from the chair to whatever committee to say, okay, what machine learning is. I end up give a mini tutorial at a dinner party. And the end of the conference, machine learning become the word, uh, a one, one word on the summary and say, oh, we need to look into the area of machine learning. So I was so proud of the moment. Of course, I'm, I'm more proud uh, in 2016, I was awarded as a water professional of the year uh, by Australian Association, Water Association. When Sydney Water prom uh, sorry, nominated me at the time, I was impossible because it's a, it's, a, it's a completely different game in the industry and the water sector, most people uh, get the award when, you know, they uh, grey head after, right before, you know, retirement, most of them, I'm not saying all of them. So I wasn't thinking it's possible. So this is shows the, you know, the driving force coming from computer science, coming from data, coming from a connected world, all this one, uh, result in very different world. And uh, I am very proud that all of us make a huge contribution to the society. I mean, of course, utilising the knowledge and the talent uh, uh, we gained in this uh, industry. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Flora? Thank you for this opportunity. So um, when I'm asked to actually reflect, uh, one article that came to mind right away was an article written by Mark Weiser in 1991. Uh, Mark Weiser is from Xerox Park Lab. Uh, he wrote an article called um, The Computer of the 21st Century. So that was 31 years ago. And um, so Mark envisioned a time uh, when computers are everywhere, ubiquitous, he called it. 
And um, he said the most profound technologies are those that disappear, that they're no longer distinguishable um, as part of daily, our daily life. And here we are, we are at that age. But when I actually read the article again, I was actually surprised there's a lot more details into it. Uh, he was talking about uh, the time when interactions become so seamless, integral uh, part of our lives that uh, you know, it are, it, these are so intertwined and they're no longer um, becoming a burden. So people no longer have a burden interacting with, with the machines, with information, information is available at, at their fingertips. And these days we no longer just have, have them on our fingertips, but also at the tip of our tongue through, let's say, a conversational system. And he had a lot of different examples of personified systems. Uh, a guy called Sal in his article that says, Sal woke up in the morning, uh, an alarm clock, uh, there's a smart assistant in this alarm clock. Again, this was written in 1991. Uh, the alarm clock actually says, uh, morning, sir, coffee. So the alarm clock anticipated his need for coffee. And then knowing exactly where he's going for, uh, for work that day, thinking about the route ahead of time, and finding him a parking spot. So. Well, we are actually at that age when everything that is predictive is available in our fingertips. Uh, what is actually more interesting is, um, at the end of the article, he wrote about, um, you know, at the time of life where the quality of life is so great that, you know, when you have computers all around you, it's just going to be like another walk in the forest. It's like a, a nice stroll, a breezeful st stroll, and you're going just to enjoy your life without having to be bothered with interacting with computers. Now, are we really there yet? That is the question. I believe um, with a lot of sensors and devices in our lives, in our pockets, um, even in our socks or shoes, some of you might be wearing one of those smart shoes, um, in, in the infrastructure, a lot more things can be learned and characterized about human life and anticipati anticipatory predictive computing are here. Um, but um, are we becoming more slaves to it or are we actually becoming those who are harnessing it? So I believe um, even as Fang mentioned, machine learning, the power of AI models, they are becoming so powerful in generalizing, generalizing patterns, even things that have not been seen before. For example, in our recent work, uh, we could actually uh, predict un, uh, and model to predict uh, unpre unprecedented events that are not yet seen in the data much better than you know maybe five years ago because these machines can better generalize. But at the core of that article was the user. Are, are we thinking about the users? Uh, are the technology that we are developing still human centric? I think this is a responsibility. Uh, that we need to have, regardless how deep we are in our, uh, our each subdiscipline, I believe with every single opportunity, um, it comes some of the uh, uh, challenges, but also with every single impact and benefit, there are costs and consequences. So what are the costs and consequences of having this ubiquitous pervasive computing and smart systems in our lives? And are we going to be more responsible and building more trustworthy, ethical systems. That's just my take. Thank you. Thank you, Flora. There seems to be a bit of a theme, and we'll come back to it in, in some more probing questions. But, John, would you like some share? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so, so, first of all, I'd just like to congratulate Genevieve on a wonderful um, opening talk. Um, I feel like I'm going to say very similar things, but perhaps using different words. Um, so I think there probably is a theme that is emerging. Um, so my, my background's in software engineering, so that's, that's the kind of sub-field of computer science that, that I come from. And we heard already this morning about a number of key events in the history of computer science. We, you know, there is the, 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 the 70th anniversary of the first Australian computer science conference. We heard about the Dartmouth conference, which was the birth of AI um, this morning in 1956. In my field in software engineering, there, there was another one and that was the Garmisch Conference, which was held in Garmisch, Germany, and that took place in 1968. And that was really the birth of software engineering as a discipline. Um, it wasn't the first time the word had been used. It had, the, the term had actually been um, coined a few years earlier than that by a NASA engineer called Margaret Hamilton. 
Um, but it was really the first time that the community had come together. And they came together because there was this thing that was emerging that was a software crisis. And that was that software was becoming more important. And people were having to build software systems at a scale that they'd never had to build them before. And they just didn't have the tools to do it. And so that was the birth of what we now think of as software engineering, which is really about how can you scale software? How can you come up with proper, reliable methodologies, uh, tools, practices, and principles? Now, a little over 50 years then of software engineering, how far have we come? Well, my, my, my claim is that it's your, if you actually look at the history of software engineering, um, we've, done, we've first of all done a great job. Um, we've had many, many researchers and practitioners around the world that have put lots and lots of effort. Um, but the focus has been very much on how can we build software that has the functionality that re we require a cost we can afford, um, that is scalable, that is safe, that is secure, that respects data privacy. All important things. But if you actually look at the history of software engineering, there is a very, very, very large gap that we haven't considered. And that is a, a broader set of human values. Genevieve used the word values um, this morning. So, and, and in particular, how do we make sure that the systems, the software systems that we build embed and respect the human values that we hold as individuals, as groups of people, um, as society. Um, and in fact, we did a study of software engineering research recently, um, and we found that it was only about 10% of research in the software engineering field that it even considered these broader human values. And, I, and I'm, I'm thinking of things like diversity, inclusion, social responsibility, environmental sustainability, even things like tradition and family. You know, how do we build systems that support families? How do we build systems that respect traditions? And we just haven't um, considered those elements anywhere near enough um, in, our, in our discipline. The good news, however, is that I think we're actually at a bit of a nexus point now. And I think we're seeing a lot more interest in considering those kind of broader human values in our field. Um, it's probably partly, um, in no small part, in fact, being spurred on by the rise of artificial intelligence and concerns, as we heard this morning, about trust in AI and the ethics of AI. Um, we now, of course, have many, many ethical frameworks across the world about how can we um, implement AI responsibly. But they're very, very high-level things. You know, in fact, if you look at the Australian government's ethics principles, number three is actually human-centered values. You should design AI systems that respect human-centered values. But what does that actually mean? And we don't yet know how to operationalize those ethical principles or those broader human values into the software systems that we develop. But I'm actually very excited about the future. Um, we've certainly seen a big shift in the AI community over recent years. Um, probably a fairly narrow take on this, I would say. A lot of focus on fairness, accountability, transparency, um, but maybe not some of those broader human values. We're starting to see a, a bit of a shift um, in the software engineering disciplines as well. Um, of course, in the Ubicomp and HTI um, disciplines and information systems and cybernetics, there's a long tradition of those things, but they really haven't yet made it into um, broader software engineering practice. Um, and I think going forward, we, we have to do that. Um, and, and we also have to focus on working with practitioners because you know, it's, it's very easy for people like us to sit here today and talk about the importance of these things. But let me tell you, if you actually go out into the software industry now, um, people don't have a proper understanding of the importance of these things. Um, Genevieve made the point that, uh, you know, software systems are not values neutral. They embody values whether you like it or not. That's a simple statement that um, people like me understand inherently but if you actually go out and talk to your, your average software engineer actually working in the industry, they have a different view to that. I was talking just the other night to a very senior person in one of the big tech companies who said, oh, you know, te technology doesn't have values. Um, it just, just depends on how it gets used. 
Um, so that, that's a fundamental mismatch, and it's a fundamental mismatch that I think we really need to address. But I, the good news is I think we can do it, and I think in the next you know, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, we're going to see a lot more of activity in that space. Um, and I think it's, it's hopefully the, the, the dawn of a new great age in computing. Thank you, John. I think that ties in very much so with what Genevieve was saying, and um, and I think it's going to tie in also with the idea of you know diversity in software engineering teams and things like that. And there's that famous, um, I guess, mishap with Google Maps pronouncing Malcolm X Street as Malcolm Ten, um, and that that's you know very, talks specifically to your point about how do we embody those his, history and tech and traditions into the um, systems that we're developing. Thank you. Um, Roger, uh, I'll let you reflect and then we can come back to some of the points that were raised. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, as Wayne alluded to, I'm slightly younger than him, but definitely go back a long way. I actually started in the computer industry in 1964 and wrote my first software in 1965. There, there were no computer science departments, uh, needless to say. Um, one of the few advantages of, of uh, <clears throat> age and having been around so long is to look back at what are the lessons, what have we seen happen over the, the course of the, the last 70 years, or certainly the last 50 or so I've been involved. And what are those lessons and what do we take from those lessons going forward? And the, and the number one lesson to me is relentless innovation. If you look back over the history, there are these sort of key inflection points. In the era of the 50s and 60s was the mainframe era, very large computers. The first computer I worked on was actually University of Melbourne, where I had to, I had to actually physically go up there and hang around for several hours to try and get a bit of computer time to be able to compile, compile my program. Um, but it was the era of what was called IBM and the Bunch. And um, IBM dominated, but there was the Bunch. Burroughs, Univac, Control Data, um, uh, NCR and Honeywell. Where are those companies today? All of them failed in the computer industry. IBM is a shadow of its former self. It used to absolutely dominate the um, industry. But it, it missed innovation in, in, a, in a big way. There was a UK um, uh, software industry as well. English Electric, Leo Computers, merged all and became um, ICL, but they, they disappeared as well. I won't go in, there were, there were various attempts to have computer, Australian made computers and computer manufacturing in, in the old days. But the lack of innovation really, um, that IBM and the bunch completely missed then the next revolution, which really was very late 60s or early into the 70s, which was the rise of the mini computer, started by Digital Equipment Corporation, Ken Olson, uh, and the like, who, and again, all this is based on uh, R&D coming out of, coming out of um, academia and, and being applied. Um, but so there was a rise of the minis throughout the 70s. My company, my original company, Computer Power Group, you know, wrote um, those. Olson always said, our computers are for engineers and scientists. That, he, that was his background, and that's the way he saw it. We thought they're very cheap computers. You could distribute lots of them around, but we needed some commercial software. So we actually wrote the first um, COBOL compiler for the PDB-11 way back and sold the world rights to digital. And then we wrote an operating system and a language um, uh, for another American um, uh, hardware company and the like. And that really pioneered and pushed um, the use of mini-computers mini out into distributed computings. Well, they, of course, then missed completely the open systems era. I remember Ken Olson talking to him um, and said, you know, people want to write software and be able to use it on any computer. And those days the software was tied to a particular comp computer. and. Uh, and he, of course, said our operating system's better than any of those Unix operating systems. Completely missed the, missed the boat and, you know, eventually digital atrophied away and sort of merged in with HP. And all those other mini computer people, um, Data General, which is where I met Wayne way back, uh, all faded um, away. And then we, of course, had the PC um, revolution that started in the um, very late... 70s, I guess when Apple was formed, um, but really the beginning of the 80s. 
IBM were famous for saying they didn't see any use for why any personal computer could be used in any business applications. And they missed the boat totally. They realised after a few years what was happening. And for the first time in their history, they decided they had to reach out and insource um, various components. They didn't have time to build it in-house, which they'd always had done. That led to the to uh, Intel and Microsoft were the two major beneficiaries of those decisions. And uh, needless to say, the rest is history. Um, so this relentless uh, innovation that is absolutely critical um, and has driven the industry right through. Then we had the first um, smartphones, the Palm Pilot, which, which was launched in 96. And again, a company that we backed in, in my venture fund um, wrote the first app store for, uh, for the Palm Pilot. Admittedly, it was pretty clunky, but we could not get Palm Pilot behind it. They thought it was all about selling hardware. They were making phones, these smartphones, and they were selling that. At best, we got them to give a voucher when you bought your smartphone, you could go onto our app store and try to load down the software. Um, needless to say, they sort of missed the boat <laughs> as well. And one of the things in 2007, when the first iPhone came out, it really was the App Store, um, the ability to, um, for, it really opened up innovation. It meant uh, lots of people could innovate, come up with applications, and instead of having to try to sell them directly, um, you could do it through, through the, the uh, App Store. That was one of the you know, fundamental changes in the sort of um, architecture, um, if, if you like. And now we have some 16 billion devices um, out around the world, and that's growing, you know, two to three billion uh, a year. So innovation, in, in both at the uh, at the application level, is really you know, greatly facilitated by that. And of course, and we're now at the beginning of the sort of Internet of Things era, where we're going to have hundreds of billions of physical devices, um, you know, ho hooked up um, to the internet. So the, the real lessons, looking back on all that, are, are just relentless innovation. That innovation comes from research and development inside universities in, and, and in the computer science departments, but more and more as well, that is being driven by users. And um, it, it used to be that the, the users were you know, large users of computing mm -hmm. and Consumer, the use of the consumer use, if you like, you know, trailed behind the use at enterprise and, and sort of government level. That really has swung right around um, because of the advent of ubiquitous uh, computing out out on the phones and iPads and all the rest of it. And and so what we're seeing now is innovation really being driven from off in many cases from users. And it's quite frustrating, and we heard a bit from, from the minister, but I remember talking to one of the CEOs of one of the banks. He couldn't believe it. He said, you know, how can I, I can load down this software on my phone at home and I'm off and running and my IT department told me it's going to cost me tens of billions of dollars in 10 years to try to, to revamp all our, our, our systems. And, the, and uh, so innovation, it's very important that the university sector and the computer science sector, you know, works with... Um, and users looking at the application you know, of, of um, how we um, how we really drive you know, the, the the use. Uh, I'll stop there. There are a number of other key innovations, or just one last one to say. I think the business model has also opened up innovation dramatically because we used to have to go in and sell you know sort of hand by hand combat to sell software into organisations, and now with the with the subscription model with the sort of freemium models you can get your so small developers and others can get software out there see what sticks see what's um, ga gathering and you've got a much better financial model because you've got recurring uh, revenues so that business change in the business model has also had a profound impact I have quite a few things to say on the on these other points that have been made because um, I do a lot of work in remote indigenous communities on uh, trying to use uh, the technology and IT to help on social disadvantage. So I look forward to talking further about that later. Thank you, Roger. Um, so I think there's, uh, if I could just kind of maybe summarise in like the main point that each of you kind of stressed on, 
Um, Fang, you mentioned, you know, things like computer science and data science being used in applications that, you know, water, water management and, and things like that. So uh, I'm going to come back to a question around um, potentially, you know, what other industries or uh, sectors or applications where, you know, computer science is a thing of its own, but really it's there to assist computation in all of these other disciplines. And so I guess my question, and, and I'll open up to everybody, but is, has there been one or maybe more sectors that have specifically benefited from computer science, or is it just a general, um, you know, benefit to humanity and every application uh, that, that exists in every industry? Um, has there been cases where it has been more beneficial in some areas or and, and potentially even detrimental in other areas? I may just start to extend to some of the conversation we had earlier. I think uh, computer science, uh, we have seen uh, tremendous uh, development and uh, application in various different industries. So name them. So from the uh, banking insurance, probably we don't need to talk uh, too much of that one. I want to t take some unsexy you know, sector to uh, uh, you know, emphasize a little bit more. I, I mentioned on the water, water is one of my love, because water, I mean, we, we can't live without water. It's a, a precious resource uh, to the community and the society to live on. How many of us knows that, uh, for example, the water quality, we, we feel it's very, very good water quality uh, and by standard. However, in order to safeguard the water quality, we need to use, you know, a couple of hundreds uh, testing sites across the city and to do the prediction model and to do the real live testing to see prediction versus your reality, how much difference is and how you're changing the dosing, chemical dosing strategy so that can safeguard all those, uh, you know, the drinking water. Uh, another one is a really not sexy one about our sewer. And, you know, and they had the sewer pipes corroded and then, you know, all the odor or the, you know, nasty spillage into the parks. You don't want to see it. And uh, personally, I went down once uh, with all the protective gears into the sewer and uh, the poor workers actually rowing the boat in some of the huge sewer to take the pictures and they try to identify where to repair. And computer vision can do that, I mean, a lot more easy. Yeah, a lot easier without uh, you know, harm to the human being and safeguard the infrastructure. And uh, last but not least, just uh, talking about uh, you know, transport as one example. And um, the computer science now become an integral part and uh, fundamental to drive across disciplinary, multidisciplinary teams. Transport science by itself is, a, of course, is a huge discipline. I'm not saying that's not worthwhile. Is a computer science team working with a transport science team in a, in a really integrated way. The, uh, one example, when we tap on, tap off your uh, Opal card at Central Station, uh, you know how many people get into the Central, but there's no a certain divide of uh, people went to which platform and you go away from city or you go, uh, uh, I mean, coming into a uh, to town hall, etc. And uh, uh, traditional transport science get a lot of assignment model, which is, uh, you know, assign the routes, okay, people should be go this way, go that way, by hypothesis. And now you, with the so many different data, you've got mobile phone data, and uh, you have, I mean, uh, various different cameras at the corridor, I'm not uh, trying to take uh, the face of Mori, but you can count it, okay, Mori is one, uh, getting into the platform. All those real-time data feeds into this connected, uh, you know, computer world, and we can calculate the real assignment of how many people get into this platform. Hence, you need this capacity. And when incident happens, how many people stuck on the one platform and how many replacement buses need it? Of course, I mean, I'm, uh, I'm not championing on this uh, chaotic uh, world this week we have, but uh, computer science really become integral part and, uh, and lead a lot of a multidisciplinary team to work together. Computer science, uh, sorry, material science, chemical um, uh, engineers, you know, transport science I mentioned. So, so many of them, in, including even psychologists, 
So we work with the UNSW, a lot of the uh, marvelous psychologists on uh, different issues meant about the mental health, about all those things. So yeah, it's a, as a, uh, Roger mentioned, a relentless uh, uh, innovation and the computer science is really now become an essential core part of that. Thank you, Feng. I think the transport um, example is really good, but now every time I go to the toilet, I'm going to be thinking computer science just by the sewage uh, example. Um, <laughs> Flora, did you, in your experience or what, what you've seen, what, what's somewhere that computer science has become very pervasive, which we might not think it is or, yeah. So uh, the word productivity means different things to different people and different occupation. We learned that through, uh, also specifically through a project that we did with Microsoft Research on the future of work. And, and basically, when you complete a task uh, and you sense a sense of accomplishment of that task, uh, that could be a, a, a something mundane or something new. And, and in a lot of those tasks in, involve decision-making processes. Now, uh, computer science or computing have actually assisted the decision-making processes in individuals and as well as organizations and in the, in the society, right? I mean, making decision whether, you know, the minister mentioned about lockdown, uh, it needs to be driven by uh, evidence. Uh, it should be data-driven as well. So um, these kind of decision-making processes have been, you know, are actually pervasive in every single industry. Some of these are becoming more automated. Um, I remember an article, McKinsey article, about the uh, uh, penetration of AI in different industry sectors, and one of the highest is manufacturing. We know that. Uh, in manufacturing, a lot of things becoming 100% um, automated, you know, only very minor. When things break down, you, you need to have a manual inspection, but otherwise things go, uh, you know, run the clock 24-7 as is as scheduled. But when things break down and when things disrupt your life, that's when your productivity is disrupted. That is when I think uh, is the next thing that we have to consider. Uh, how do we design systems that are robust to all the changes in our lives. And, and, and uh, at, at individual level, I believe that, uh, you know, we have been relying on a lot of these digital assistants, like last night, again, talking about uh, trans transport planning. I mean, planning the route back to the hotel after dinner. Uh, Aaron and I tried to get uh, a cab, but it kept getting, getting canceled on us, tried an Uber. We finally managed to get one. But that was 30 minutes of our productivity being killed simply just trying to connect to a service and just trying to actually understand. If only the Mark Weiser's vision has truly come true, that information will be already in our fingertip, actually anticipating we will need a cap, and this is where you're going to get it. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. John? Yeah, um, look, there's no doubt. Computer science is everywhere. Every, every industry is getting disrupted. Um, but I, I actually think um, that presents, whilst it presents great opportunities for us, because as computer scientists, we can have impact in a way that we've never been able to impact, have impact before. I think it actually also prevents a kind of a moment of crisis for computer science as a discipline. And, and, and I think there's three reasons why I think that. Um, so, so the first is that there are so many application areas that we could apply ourselves. And so we actually have to make very, very difficult choices about where we're going to focus, and that's not easy. So I often say, you know, working in digital, it's a blessing and it's a curse. You know, it's a blessing because everybody wants to work with us. It's a curse because everybody wants to work with us. And if you're not careful, you're just going to get torn and in lots of different directions. Um, the second reason is because the, those opportunities are going to be realized where you can work across those disciplines in different application areas. But that's not easy because you can't just go into transport or mining or whatever it is and say, hey, I've got a computer science solution for you. You've got to deeply understand the domain that you're working in. And we don't train, of course, our computer scientists to understand all of those different domains because there are just too many different domains. So I think that's, that's a real challenge. And then the third reason why I think it's a real challenge for us is because there's a danger that as computer scientists, we, it, we just become a service to other disciplines, you know. Um, and so how do we get that balance right between, you know, not just being seen as the kind of data scientist for hire to go and help out the transport logistics person versus actually um, furthering the, the discipline of computer science itself. And I think we really have to focus on getting that, that uh, 
balance correct. Very interesting. Thank you. Well, the, the largest um, industry sector that's been affected by computers is, is finance and banking. They've always dominated. And if it's not just the banking. We know we can draw cash out anywhere in the world. We've got tap and go anywhere in the world, et cetera, et cetera. But we've got online stock exchanges all around the world, et cetera, asset management. That has been the biggest sector. The most amount of investment dollars has gone into, the, into that sector, except for last quarter um, in the US, for the first time, um, digital health um, received more investment dollars, more venture capital dollars than, uh, than, than the finance uh, sector. But there's some salutary warnings here, and I have a lot of investments and in, quite heavily involved in that sector as well. And um, <coughs> as we know, Silicon Valley sometimes can be quite arrogant. So quite a number of the leading Silicon Valley f firms, uh, and not just Silicon Valley, but basically said, with artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, etc., we can really come in and solve some of these major um, health uh, issues. And uh, uh, and uh, just recently, uh, IBM gave up on their Watson program with using AI in, in uh, looking at, particularly in radiology. And uh, Google also just um, uh, disbanded in their, their other health practice and disseminated through other parts of, uh, of the business. What they found was that when you got actually to, to the seat where the technology is going to be used, um, it was inappropriate. It didn't work. didn't take into account a lot of the work practices. I'm very familiar with uh, digitised mammograms, as an example. And yes, you can get some smart technology and the like, trying to pick up early detection of, of cancers and the like, but it just hasn't worked in the workplace. And, and so the, the lesson there, of course, is the science has to marry up and to get the absolute understanding of what those people are doing in a day-to-day -day job, where a radiologist has 30 seconds to look at a mammogram and a false positive destroys their workflow, as an example. So it's a salutary lesson, I think, particularly in health, I would say. Yeah, I think uh, that um, kind of coincides with what John is saying about domain expertise as well. Not just domain as in the actual... Um, you know, fundamental knowledge of that space, but understanding how it fits into the workflows is really important and something that uh, is often kind of uh, dictated by those above and, and forced down onto the people that actually have to work with the systems, which, uh, you know, they have no understanding of how things happen on a day-to-day -day basis, actually. And, and just, just a postscript to that, because there's actually... Um you know, if you're going to introduce technology, there's actually multiple work practices that you're introducing it into. And there's a very famous paper, I forget who wrote it now, the HCI people will know, but it's written in the 80s and it was a study of why technology adoption goes wrong. And one of the key things that that paper says is that, you know, the, the adoption is driven from a certain, um, a certain subsection of the working population. So it's typically the managers, right, that commission that technology. And it might end up making life a whole lot easier for the managers, but for everybody else, it makes life a whole lot worse because those working practices weren't taken to, into account as well. That's right. I had so many questions about who is actually driving <laughs> the innovation in computer science. Is it big industry? Is it, uh, you know, as it c consumers, um, you know, with, with smartphones at their fingertips? But um, we probably only have time for one last uh, question. And I think that question needs to be around um, something that's been a main thread to, I think, every speaker. And it's about, you know, even with respect to productivity, um, how is computer science contributing to quality of life? Um, and, um, you know, I mean, how much more productive do we need to be? What does the future look like? I'm, I'm envisaging, like, every, every kind of uh, futuristic movie you've ever seen tends to end in, in a dystopian um, ending, which uh, I hope we're not heading in that direction. But um, what, what does m more productivity look like? And, uh, you know, next maybe 10 or 20 years, what does that look like? We'll start from the other end, <laughs> Roger. Yeah. Well, I, I did want to make a, a comment, um, as I said, about the, if you like, the, uh, the digital divide or whatever. But I did a lot of work in indigenous uh, communities. And we're all sitting here in an urban environment. We're taking a lot of things for, for granted. But it's recently in the Torres Strait Islands, 
And they're trying to do, deliver education services because there's um, 30 schools scattered around Ireland. You know, they, there's not enough bandwidth to do a Zoom call. Um, even though we put up satellites and other things, with it, it's just uh, bandwidth is a, a huge issue. Remote delivery of health services, you can imagine, you know, diabetes and things like that, are huge health issues in, in remote communities and, and regional uh, communities. Uh, again, bandwidth is a huge issue, but usability uh, on, the, on the ground, people being trained, being able to... Um, uh, there are a lot of cultural issues. Well, one, I won't go into the detail, but one area that I've been doing some uh, contributing in, the issues of uh, the adoption of the technology, which can actually solve some of the problems, it's uh, serious cultural issues uh, and the like. So the take-up of technology is, is actually very uneven. Mm. And uh, there's another sector that's affected as well, is the ag tech. Ag tech's a big growing area and obviously very important to Australia. But again, bandwidth is quite an issue and, um, uh, and, and the like. So it's very important to understand the sort of social implications of, if you like, this rollout and the gap between a lot of urban um, applications, if you like, and, and these uh, regional and remote. Thank, thank you, Roger. It's, it's sometimes, yeah, uh, being here, obviously, with everything being so ubiquitous, it's, it's hard to remember that that's not the case everywhere in the world, obviously. So when we talk about ubiquitous computing, it is more about equal distribution across the entire globe, I think, as well. Um, John? Yeah, so you, the question you asked was, uh, how, how is computer science contributing to the quality of life? That's a rather large question to ask in the dying minutes, in one minute in the dying minutes of a panel. Um, so I won't, I won't even attempt to, but look, look I think it, com it comes back to what I started with, is that um, we, we need to put more work into thinking about what values we want as a society and then coming up with better ways, better tools, methodologies, practices to embed those things into our software systems. Um, the, the good news is that there are some great exemplars out there, so I would encourage anybody thinking about that or wanting to do that to, to go and look at these exemplars and just to give, give you one picking up on the, the theme that Roger started. So there's, there's a wonderful team within CSIRO that are using AI um, with indigenous communities to help better track um, invasive weed species. So they're using, they're flying drones over country, um, they're using AI computer vision to detect um, where these weeds are. But, but critically, they're not, they're not they, they, first of all, it's not been driven by computer scientists, it's, they're not leading the project, but they're not going in and saying, okay, we've got this great technology, we can solve all your problems. From the beginning, it was a co-designed process working with the indigenous rangers, um, they, were just, they were deciding you know, what the interfaces looked like, what the technology was gonna do, and crucially, what it wasn't going to do. So there's some, there are many, many great examples out there that we can use for inspiration, and I think that is a good starting point. So um, with regards to productivity, um, on the other side of a coin is always well-being. So, and that is, again, um, at the heart of the article by Mike Weiser, that you know, it should not become at the expense of well-being. So um, at the end of the consumer products, we need to be considerate about what will that be. Even, for example, recommender systems for Uber or Airbnb, what does it do with the well-being of the community around it? Is there any social responsibility of the non-users of the system, for example? You know, uh, traffic becoming more congested and, you know, neighborhood becoming... Uh, actually no longer livable, for example, right? Kind of, I mean, the, the corporate social responsibility has been well established in, in industry like mining, for example, right? But what is the corporate social responsibility looks like for tech companies? I think it is not clear yet, um, you know, uh, with a lot of Airbnb going around and how does it actually potentially even trash the community and make it worse? Uh, a couple of questions to think about, and also in terms of computer science productivity. Um, I, I remember reading an article by uh, Yoshio Bengio and a couple of others uh, who are actually expressed a concern on uh, extreme productivity of AI communities who produce papers so much. Does productivity mean always faster, or do we need to actually maybe advocate more on a better science of the computer science? Taking things a bit slower and having a more significant impact. Thank you. Feng? 
I wanted to use my last minute to talk about the sustainability. I think is a yeah, probably is a is a is a buzzword. But if we're thinking about what we live on, is the land, is the water, is uh, you know the air, is uh, you know energy, all those ones is uh, making a big part of our quality of life. So some uh, some things uh, we uh, in last number of years we get into really uh, heavily is uh, for example carbon how you measure the carbon in the so in the soil how you actually are uh, knowing provide a certain you know at least the discoveries or insights of uh, how to uh, preserve our land in the best way to uh, support the uh, crops growth. And uh, the other one is uh, for, uh, the EV, uh, electric vehicle is coming to, and how, what's the impact of EV to our grid? And uh, this is the intersection of a lot of the things, I mean, not on transport, not on energy, but uh, what computer science do, computer science is actually using data, using uh, sort of a connected uh, computational model to mimicking the, the world and to provide the insights and provide the, uh, evidence-based conversations to the experts and to say, okay, this is what we observed, for example, at a, a, a load surge of the certain, certain suburbs when they have a lot of a charging port and, a, and the people charging off the work at a particular point of time. And how are you going to maintain that if you have a, another 20% of EV intake? Right, those all the observed by the data and, and calculated, predicted by the computing model and suggested to you know, whoever run the grid, whoever do this uh, EV intake say, okay, this is a conversation this community and the society need to have. So I, I think, uh, yeah, computer science is really uh, taking a lead in that aspect of discoveries and, uh, and um, you know, uh, bring a lot of conversations and a lot of, uh, you know, multidisciplinary team, as I mentioned before, to work on something which is really uh, benefited to society, to our citizens. Thank you. Um, so there's been a lot of recurring themes um, and I guess this is the opportunity in the morning tea break, actually someone else will announce that, sorry, <laughs> um, to, to continue these conversations further. But human-centric design, ubiquitous computing, um, productivity, uh, how much more productive do we need to be? Uh, it, it, does that come at a cost to our well-being, to sustainability? How do we incorporate human values into our computing systems? So many big big conversations to be had and I look forward to having more of these conversations in the future. Please thank all the panellists um, for sharing their thoughts.